What's up guys, Jace Two Cents here, and I'm gonna do something that I've never done on this channel, but I promise you that I would. We're gonna do a little bit of a build guide in terms of picking parts. I'm gonna give a set budget, and we're gonna kinda go through here and talk about picking the parts and how to make sure things are compatible, um, and to sort of give you a little bit of a guide at a price point. But more importantly, everyone talks about how to build the tower. But realistically, one of the most common questions that we get on this channel isn't about building the tower, it's about picking the parts. So today we are bringing you Jay's PC Part Picking 101. That's the first class in college courses. Unless you go to community college, then it's whatever they call it. Featuring the Intel 9750H six core processor, up to 64 gigabytes of memory and multiple GPU options, the Mag15 laptop from Electronics is one of the lightest production and gaming notebooks on the market. Due to its magnesium lightweight chassis and 15.6 inch 144 hertz IPS monitor, the Mag15 weighs in at just four pounds, while the 94 watt hour battery provides hours of use on a single charge. To see the full spec list of the Mag15 from Electronics and to see their complete lineup of laptops and notebooks, click the sponsor link in the description below. All right, so the way I'm gonna do this here is I'm gonna use Newegg to kind of build my cart. It's kind of messed up, I guess, but Newegg has pretty much every part in the industry there. And then what I'll do is I'll take that parts list and I will kind of shop it against other retailers and e-tailers to try and get the best prices. Yes, I'm well aware that PC Part Picker does this, but PC Part Picker also uses pretty much any e-tailer, kind of like anywhere, uh, including some that I've never even heard of, and I'm not comfortable buying from e-tailers that I've never heard of. So this is the way I'm gonna do it. If you wanna use PC Part Picker to do the very same thing, you certainly can. Um, I just tend to do manual price shopping because I like it better. So what we're gonna do is we're not gonna talk so much about the parts we're picking we're gonna talk about why we're picking the parts we're picking. So this isn't necessarily gonna be a cookie cutter parts list, although at the end of this video, we will show you the way we spent the thousand dollars, which is the price point that I've chosen for this first video of trying to bring you these ways to think about shopping. It's designed to help you think about the way to choose these parts, not so much what we, what we chose. The most expensive single part you're gonna pretty much buy is gonna be, well, especially if you're doing a gaming system, is going to be your video card or your graphics card. The way I tend to budget for this, is I tend to have it be anywhere between 30 to 40% of the total cost of the system. So if I'm building a $1,000 system, it means I've got between three and $400 to spend on a graphics card without having to make too many sacrifices somewhere else in the budget to then get everything to fit. Because remember, there's like seven main components that you have to get into your system. You've got to get your CPU, your RAM, your motherboard, your graphics card, your storage, your power supply, and your case. So those are seven components, technically eight if you do it the way I do it, which is going to be an SSD as well as a large capacity spinning hard drive. So by sticking within that 30 to 40% um, budget ratio, it means that I'm not gonna have to make too many sacrifices later on based on those seven or eight components that I just mentioned. So it makes it pretty easy though with Newegg, you can just sort by your price and it actually works out really well because on the left-hand side right here, if we scroll down to our sorting, we can go right to 300 to $400. So since we know that $1,000 is our total budget, I'm shopping within that particular price point. And what I'd like to do is I tend to kind of price my, my GPU to be no more than 50% of the total budget of the system, but usually it's gonna fall between more like 30 and 40% of the total cost of your system. So it's gonna be the single most expensive part. So the next most expensive thing you're probably gonna spend on your system is gonna be your CPU uh, and your motherboard combo. Now, depending on where you're shopping, you can find a lot of combo deals. And I, I basically recommend finding the CPU that you wanna go with based on what your tasks are gonna be. And I already know that within this $1,000 price point, the best performance to price ratio uh, is gonna be with AMD, AMD's Ryzen. What, what you need to know though, once you decide on which part you wanna go with, is you need your socket type to be uh, compatible. And it's kind of simple now with AMD because all the mainstream stuff is AM4+. Plus. And because of the forward and backwards compatibility AMD's promised uh, till about 2022, I think it is, it means anything AM4 Plus is gonna be compatible with each other. Now, there are some caveats to that. Caveat, caveat, there are, there are some exceptions to that. You can take a newer generation Ryzen CPU and pair it with an older generation Ryzen motherboard. So although you can go backwards compatible like that and save some money, I tend to make sure I stick with a generation of CPU and motherboard that are matched, or at least go with a newer motherboard than the current CPU that I'm with, if they are compatible with each other. If you're not the kind of person that's looking at changing this in the next year or two, and you're a five-year builder plus, you, you aim for that five-year uh, mark of having the CPU or the PC last, then this is kind of irrelevant to you. And if you make sure you stick with the same generation CPU and motherboard, then it means that you're gonna guarantee that all the features of the CPU that you have 
are there and unlocked and ready to go. And the motherboard's built to the capacity it needs to be built to, to support the particular CPU that you've put in there. So for the motherboard, we actually chose the MSI B450 Tomahawk Max, and we chose that for a couple of reasons. One, we've used it in the past, um, several times actually, and it's a very well-designed, well-built, and a very good value of a motherboard. It doesn't have the highest chipset series for the CPU that we selected. But that's because we also didn't go with the highest end CPU from the generation that we could have. So it's a pretty well-matched motherboard to CPU. Now the CPU we actually chose was the AMD Ryzen 5 2600X. It's a six core, 12 thread CPU, 4.2 gigahertz turbo clock. Um, it's more than enough horsepower to do live streaming, gaming, video rendering, just it's a really well-rounded all around CPU. And we save some money because it's not the latest generation of CPU from AMD. And because it's still available with current support and a really slashed price, it's really hard to beat its performance to price ratio. But that also means going with a super high-end motherboard that has all these features designed for like the 3700X, which we're not using, makes no sense. It would be wasted money. The B450 Tomahawk Max gives us four DIMM slots that we can expand our memory later on if we go with a dual channel kit now, which means if we went with a cheaper motherboard, we wouldn't be able to do that unless we replace both sticks of RAM. So for now, for this build, we're going to go with two sticks of RAM and then the option to add more later. So memory is pretty simple. You're not getting gouged like you were two years ago. There's no huge memory shortage around the world and it's $200 for 16 gigabytes or $100 plus for a single eight gigabyte stick. You can now get 16 gigabytes for well under 100 bucks. In fact, we're looking right now, all I did was search DDR4. One of the first ones that comes up right here is a $69 set of two times eight gigabyte DIMMs of 3200 megahertz RAM uh, from G-Skill Ripjaws. When it comes to shopping for RAM, First gen Ryzen definitely benefited from as fast as memory as you could get. And that was because of the infinity fabric and the way that the, the chiplets all talk to each other. That's kind of changed now with the 2000 series. It was not nearly as important, but still somewhat impactful on performance. And the 3000 series, we, we're not really seeing much of an a performance benefit or hit by speeding it up or slowing it down. With Intel, on the other hand, um, the faster the memory, it really goes well with the high overclocks that you can get with Intel CPUs. So I tend to find the sweet spot to be right around, to be honest, 3000 megahertz. But if your budget can't afford it, 2666 is gonna be just fine. It's easy to overspend on memory by going, I want the fastest memory possible. But again, unless you're using very memory intensive niche tasks that are gonna need the super fast um, megahertz ratings of memory with very tight timings, I think in a blind taste test, you'd have a hard time seeing 2666 versus 4000 and just basic computing, you're never gonna notice it. So when it comes to memory though, you obviously are gonna want to go with dual channel if you've got a dual channel motherboard, or if you're running like an X platform on either Threadripper or Intel, then you're gonna want one stick per channel and those are four channel systems. So you would need four sticks to make sure there's at least one stick in each of those channels. How do you know what you got? Well, unless you paid an awful lot for your CPU, you don't have four channels, I promise unless you bought a 3950X and then you only have dual channel and that's expensive too. So I guess the whole argument just went out the window. All right, I guess a better way to say it is it doesn't say Threadripper or Intel Extreme, you don't need four sticks. We interrupt this video to bring you a special message from iFixit. Bring you iFixit by the makers of iFixit. Got a crappy graphics card? That's okay. Fix it with iFixit. iFixit has all the tools you need to make your life better. Got a dirty phone screen? That's okay. You can fix it with iFixit. Thirsty? That's okay. Fix that thirst with iFixit. Mm, refreshing. Use iFixit to fix your computer or even just upgrade it. Oh, iFixit can fix anything, even this and this. Got a problem with your friend? Fix him too with I fix it. They'll appreciate it. Guaranteed. Disclaimer, I fix it doesn't actually cost bills, fix friends, fix cars, fix tires, or fix things that are not designed to be fixed with I fix it tools. But that's okay, because I fix it anyway. To find out more, click the link in the description below. Yeah, I fix it. Explosion. All right, so based off the seven main components I've already said, we've got three left, basically. We've got power supply, we've got case, we've got storage. So case is something I'm gonna shop for last because it's just a box. It's a box that your parts go in, it's an enclosure. And the reason why it's an enclosure, people have always wondered like, Jay, why, don't you just, why can't you just put a computer on the desk? Well, by having an enclosure and having fans, it means you control the environment, you control the airflow. It's just a box to give you some sort of an atmosphere to move air, to keep things nice and cool. The only time the case is gonna ever 
ever affect your system performance is if you have terrible airflow and your parts start thermal throttling. Past that, if it fits your motherboard and you go with the right size case that matches your ATX form factor, so ATX, full size ATX need an ATX case, MATX need an MATX or an ATX, you can always put a smaller motherboard in a bigger case, but not the other way around unless you really go with the Dremel. So I tend to choose the case last because sometimes it's the piece that I also buy used if I have a very strict budget. Because it's the le least impactful on your system, I don't want to spend a lot of money there because what you gain with a lot of money spent on a case is aesthetics. But aesthetics at the end of the day, having a beautiful case, like let's say my Inman 928, but then I've got a $500 budget build crammed into it. What sense is that? So it's really easy to imbalance your system by spending too much money on your case, which is why we're gonna go right to power supply. Now, power supplies are one of those things that I think a lot of people tend to overcomplicate. As long as they're at 80 plus rated or higher, and you're not using some gray box that came out of some case with a power supply included with it, you're usually not gonna run into too much of a problem. Mainstream systems that are not putting extreme loads on the power supply with running two overclocked graphics cards and a 16 core 32 thread CPU that's overclocked and water cooled, you're very rarely ever gonna notice that your power supply is underpowered, um, which is why I tend to shop right around the 80 plus gold rating. So what that tells me is the components used in the power supply are better than average, they've got better capacitors, the rail design is gonna be more improved, and that 80 plus rating is nothing more than an efficiency rating. It tells you how efficient the power supply is to generate the power advertised based on the power it pulls from the wall. What you might find though is between gold and like titanium, it's like two or 3% at the most in terms of efficiency levels. Gold has the most power supplies in its category. A lot of people go right past bronze or right past silver from bronze to gold in terms of their power supply designs and then right past gold to titanium now, kind of surpassing platinum. So gold is just where the best price to performance ratio is gonna be. So there's no reason to, to buy a super expensive power supply. You just need to make sure it's sized properly for your graphics card, which is the most single demanding power component in your system. It's gonna pull way more watts than your CPU under load. If you're doing gaming, your CPU hardly ever goes under a full load anyway. Your, your graphics card, as long as it's not being bottlenecked, will go immediately to its max power draw to give you all the performance um, it can based on you know, your settings and, and your overhead. And so what I'm gonna say is that if, with the 2060, which is what the CPU or the GPU is that we actually chose for this build, and again, we'll do a full rationale at the end, calls for about a 500 watt power supply or like a 400 watt power supply. It's nothing crazy. But because of that efficiency curve, like I said, when it comes to power supplies, I like to oversize my power supplies by a good 15, 20% at times. So I'm gonna actually shop between 500 and 600 watt power supplies in 80 plus gold for this particular system. So which brings us to our last component minus case, like I talked about, which is our storage. Now with a thousand dollars, we don't have to make a lot of sacrifices to our, our storage. If we were trying to shop at like a $500 price point, then there's some sacrifices that need to be made. And I get pushed back on this all the time, but the way I tend to build my systems is one SSD that's as big as I can afford while still affording a large spinning drive to put large files, large games, backups, pictures, music, movie files that are large in capacity that can easily chew through an SSD. Um, that way I can have both. And the, the best way, the cheapest way to get max storage is with hard drives. Now, a lot of people will say, yeah, but Jay, hard drives are perfectly fine for your operating system and such. But I'm gonna tell you right now, my personal opinion on this matter is that with how inexpensive SATA SSDs are today, there is no reason whatsoever you shouldn't actually be going with a, a SATA SSD for your main OS and your favorite games and programs drive. They're fast. Um, sure, they're not NVMEs, you know, 3,500 megabytes per second. But when it comes to building a system like this, a, a SATA SSD in general use and clicking around in your operating system and loading programs, that's the way that I tend to do it. Now, when it comes to sizing your SSD, things are a heck of a lot cheaper than they used to be. So if you're searching for internal SSDs, just sort by the form factor two and a half inch and then come down here to capacity. And it's kind of weird the way Newegg brackets these. It's 276 gigabytes to 550. We can get a 500 gigabyte Crucial MX500, which I've got like three of them sitting in the box over there because we've used them in so many builds. Um, it's got an average of four out of five eggs with 374 reviews. So that's one that I'm confident in. In fact, I'll go ahead and add that one to the cart. 
But then like I said, I always pair that SSD because although 500 gigabytes seems like a lot, I always pair it with a hard drive because with games now being north of 100 gigabytes, like Red Dead Redemption 2 is 116 gigabytes for one game. And then after Windows is installed, it's gonna eat like 60 gigabytes of your SSD. And then once Windows partitions and all that, you're gonna lose a few more gigabytes to partitioning. You're gonna be left with like 300 and some odd gigabytes before you even installed your first program other than your operating system. So you can see why having a, a spinning hard drive is also worthwhile. Now, I'm gonna give you a little secret here. Spinning hard drives seem so freakishly slow when they're housing your operating system, which is true. Boot times kind of suck compared to SSDs. They've gotten better, but they definitely are slow. And then when your operating system is on a spinning drive and you're loading programs that are happening and the, the platter is having to seek all over the place, you'll find load times are slow. It's, you know, you click on something, you go to the bathroom, you come back and it's just finishing up. But when it's not handling the operating system and it's just sitting there on its own SATA controller, just waiting for you to call something up, its cache is not constantly having to swap out. If you're playing the same games and stuff that are stored on your hard drive and it's stored in cache, then it's gonna load very quickly. In fact, we've done side-by-side -side comparisons here with secondary SSDs and secondary hard drives side-by-side -side and saw that sometimes it's only 15 or so percent faster on an SSD than a hard drive. And as long as you go with a decent hard drive and a 7200 RPM and one that has a large cache, then what you're gonna find is that Having a hard drive is not nearly as bad as a lot of people want to make it out to be. It's when you have the operating system on there that that tends to be a problem. I also tend to go with at least a two terabyte. They're cheap enough now. There's no reason. Seagate is a very reputable brand. You've got Western Digital, which is twice as much as, as Seagate. Um, but that's where you're going to want to do, do your research on various hard drive types, what the colors mean, because Western Digital is always in like black, blue, green, red, and each color is a different task it's designed for. And for 54 bucks, and an average of four eggs uh, out of 596 reviews, add to cart. So what does that bring our grand total to? $854.88 prior to tax. Our total with tax is $944.78, which only really leaves us about $50 for a case. Now, like I said already, cases are extremely subjective. As long as they're giving you the proper airflow, and they could fit your motherboard and all your components in there and nothing interferes and touches, and you are fine looking at either a beige box, a black box with a steel interior, and you don't care what it looks like, you just wanna play your games, you're gonna set it on the floor or in the closet and not look at it, then don't waste your money on an expensive case. But I can tell you right now that things have definitely gotten a lot better when it comes to cases. In fact, there's a lot of brands out there too I've never even heard of that are that are there. So if we just shop computer cases and we look for ATX full tower, um, we get a lot of options that show up. So you got the Corsair Carbide 200R for 69 bucks. That's technically out of our price point, but this is where you can start to make a few adjustments here. You could potentially go down to a one terabyte hard drive and save about 10 or 15 bucks. If you're not convinced you're gonna need two terabytes, you could step down the graphics card maybe slightly. Um, I'm confident in the fact that you can find a case in here that you would want to use. I'd be fine with your parts. It's not going to break the bank. Like we've got this DIY PC black USB 3.0 ATX case, and it looks like it has fans actually. See, that's the thing with cases though. Many of them don't include fans. And if they do, they're often garbage because they know people are going to put in whatever fan that they want. The problem is when you could buy a Corsair 120 millimeter light loop fan that costs $30 or more per fan, you can easily spend $500 in a single case with fans. It's insane. So that's where you have to decide what you are okay with spending. But this, this actually looks like it has an intake fan, a side panel fan that blows right down on your graphics card, and a rear exhaust fan. And guess what? It is $33. It's got 82 reviews, four out of five eggs. I will click that one into our, into our build. $888 prior to tax and shipping. We've got no additional like warranty sitting on here because sometimes it likes to add a little three-year warranty there without you knowing it. Secure checkout, that brings our grand total to $988.98. The subtotal shows $1,018 because we're getting an Xbox Game Pass card with our um, AMD CPU because it's an AMD deal and promo going on right now. So that's why it shows also a minus $29.99 for gift one. That's what that is. So we did it. We actually did a $1,000 PC, including tax, 
and we didn't scrimp on our parts. And if we look at our parts right here and what we chose, you see them in the, uh, like a really weird order. But the case, the DIY PC, it's got a really good review. Place hold a certain amount of money there if you don't like the case that I chose. Obviously, that's subjective land. You have to decide what case that you're gonna like. Just remember, airflow, motherboard fitment, um, you know, form factor that's gonna fit all your, your stuff. If you go with like a really cheap $30 case and you somehow scored a 2070 and it's a long card, it may not fit. So that's, those are the kind of things you have to think about. Our Seagate Barracuda two terabyte drive, um, which I already explained as to why I chose that one. Our motherboard, uh, B450 Tomahawk Max AM4 AMD uh, motherboard, explained why with the PCI Express slots, the four times dims, the beefy ro uh, robust built VRM. It's the same generation as the CPU that we chose, which is an AMD Ryzen 5 2600X six core 12 thread CPU. So lots of multi-threading uh, taking place with that. 16 gigabytes of G-Skill Ripjaws V-Series, um, 3200 megahertz. So we know that if you enable the DOCP setting, which will go into BIOS and make it run at that speed, otherwise it'll run at base DDR4 speed. We know our AMD CPU is gonna love 3200 megahertz. Uh, we've got our MX500, 500 gigabyte SATA SSD. And then our graphics card, this, was a, this is always the hardest one because it's, again, it's the single most expensive piece and there's a lot of competition taking place in the CPU space or GPU space, even amongst a single brand. Like NVIDIA has got cards competing with itself, which is kind of crazy. So we chose the brand new EVGA RTX 2060 KO Ultra. The reason for that, the 2060 is about to come under serious attack with the 5600, 5600 XT AMD graphics card coming out uh, very soon. It was debuted at CES. So what's kind of happened here is the price point here has sort of gotten more competitive where now you can get a standard 2060 for under 300 bucks, $299, or you can get the faster um, factory overclocked 2060 KO Ultra for 319. So for me personally, I thought the 20 bucks was worth the extra um, price considering we're getting a faster than a 2060 graphics card for the cheaper than what a 2060 actually was just a month ago. And it didn't kill our budget. We stayed within budget. And I wasn't gonna gain any serious SSD storage space by saving the 20 bucks. I wasn't gonna gain any serious uh, space when it came to our hard drive. I wasn't gonna go with a higher tier CPU with that extra. So what I do is I go, okay, I can save 20 bucks here. And if I spent that somewhere else, what would I gain? Would I gain another performance tier of something? And if the answer is no, then I stick with it, which is what we sort of did here. And depending on what the performance of the 5600 XT ends up looking like, this whole, this part might've changed. But I have to go based on what we have today and what's available, and that's what we chose. So guys, this has just been my kind of a walkthrough of how to pick your PC parts when building your next gaming rig. This is kind of fun though. We're gonna save this parts list. We might end up building this system and benchmarking it. I know it's what a lot of other guys do. I know Paul does it, I believe Kyle does it too where he'll kind of do a video picking parts like this, order all the stuff, build it, benchmark it, and go, hey, this is how it went. Because like I said in the start of this video, the problem is almost everyone teaches you how to build the system, but not many people ever tell you how and walk you through picking your parts. Phil has friends that build or building PCs, and I have people that are emailing me by the millions, and it's like, the most common question we have is not, how does this part fit together? Or where does this plug in? It's how do I choose? Which part should I get? What CPU, what graphics card? Because it's confusing. And like we said in one of our other videos about um, one of the reasons why you may or may not want to build your own PC, one of the reasons we chose that you may not want to is the overwhelming amount of parts out here and your overwhelming fear of having something be incompatible or just making bad decisions. So if you guys like this video, do me a favor, hit that thumbs up button and subscribe if you're new around here. And why don't you go ahead and comment down below how you would spend $1,000 if you were building a system here? Yes, I know $1,000 goes a lot farther in the US than it does in other countries. So obviously you'll have to adjust this based on your market value and inflation and whatever in your particular sector of the world. Sector three, gamma quadrant. I don't know, whatever. Thanks for watching guys as always. We'll see you in the next one.